Jesus Christ said, all things are possible to him that believeth. I accept that. I believe that. I believe the Holy Bible is the sacred word of God. And this coming Sunday, on this station, you can hear and see for yourself miracle testimonies, the word of God preached in truth. That's this Sunday on this station. Watch the Max Solberger program. The Miracle Television Ministry presents Canada's missionary evangelist, Reverend Max Solbrecken, proclaiming the first century gospel for 20th century needs. Multitudes around the world have been saved, healed, and blessed by the Lord, as Max Solbrecken has presented these great Bible truths to many peoples. His crusades have taken him to places like the Philippine Islands, Manila, India, Trinidad, the West Indies, Norway, Jerusalem, and even among the headhunters of northern Luzon. And now by the medium of television, he comes into your home with the message of God's love and power. And you know, when you seek the face of the Lord, His blessings will come. But oftentimes we seek the blessings and we miss the God of the blessings. Amen? God wants us to seek Him. So this...
Hallelujah. Aren't you glad for the blood of Jesus? Yes, Lord. Praise God. The Lord is doing some wonderful things and we're so happy to have with us uh, to bring the message this morning, Dr. Max Solbrickin. And I don't, I'm not sure if, if you know, uh, those of you maybe you're, you're fairly new, but I was just leaning over to him asking him when was the last time he was with us and uh, he was telling me it was sometime in when uh, Pastor Rick Seward was here. So that kind of indicates to me that it was sometime in 1993 uh, when uh, in between uh, Pastor Sapp retiring and, and I taking over. And uh, since then, God has just continued to use him. But Brother Max uh, Solbrickin is known as Canada's missionary evangelist. Many call him the apostle to the poor because of his extensive ministry to the nations of the third world. For 30 years, he has shared the gospel of Jesus with multitudes of, of poor, sick, and needy people on every continent. He preaches, now hear this, he preaches hell hot, sin black, eternity long, and God's grace unfathomable. Amen? Amen. I mean, he doesn't cut it, he just counts it like it is. He preaches the Bible, and I praise God for that. And God has graciously performed many miracles of healing and, and answers to His prayer. And with Him today is His beautiful wife, Donna. Would you stand? We'd like to recognize Donna. And uh, thank the Lord that they And she's here along with her sister, Irene. Would you stand? And, and uh, just welcome you here. They have six children and 11 grandchildren. Big family. They have obeyed the Lord and multiply, fill the earth. And it's, it brings me great joy to introduce Dr. Max Solbrick. And let's give him a hand of welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It's such a joy for me to be here with you today and such a joy to sense the presence of God, to feel His mighty power, and to know that He is the same yesterday and today and forever. Amen. To know that He will do His miracles today as He did yesterday. Amen. He'll do them again tomorrow because He does not change. Amen. Many years ago, I was in the country of India, 1984 I believe it was, when I went to northern India to a place called Ahmedabad, in Gujarat state. I had wanted to go to South India, but uh, God would not allow me. I had 3,000 pastors who were gonna back our crusade in Madras with about 100,000 in the first service. It would grow to possibly 200,000 in 10 days. God said to me, I want you to go to North India. I want you to go to Gujarat, to Ahmedabad, to the city of Mahatma Gandhi, the city where they killed Mahatma Gandhi. Now you must realize that they did not kill him because they hated him. They killed him because they loved him too much to let him live. He was bringing the untouchables into government and the Hindus rose up and they killed him. That was the city to which God sent me. There were no Pentecostal or evangelical people there to back our crusade. So two Methodist churches back our crusade. There were 10 churches in the city, but only two of them would back our crusade. We started with about 3,000 people in a large park where there'd be room for possibly 100,000 plus to stand or sit on the grass. The night we arrived, we came to the service and there were a quarter of a million people on the streets. Actually, Ramadan had started the feast of the, of the Muslims had started, the feast of Ramadan. A quarter of a million were on the streets. They were in a large parade. The Hindus had had 10 days of crusade services to preach their radical Hinduism. And they were warning people to stay away from our services. Do not go to that crusade in the park. Now normally the Hindus are very, very open to the gospel. But these were the fanatical Hindus. They had 10 days of red hot revival services, Hindu, Brahmin meetings in that park. 
The first night I preached the gospel and the power of God came upon us. I was very, very um, surprised to see that only about 75 people answered the altar call. Amazed. Out of 3,000, only about 75 to 100 people came forward. But I prayed for the sick and some miracles happened. The next night, there were 6,000. Unbeknownst to me, the Hindus had had a meeting and they had decided that we would not continue. They were going to close down our crusade. This would be our final service and the Hindus would have another 10 days of Hindu revival. I did not know this. They sent letters to the police saying that they were going to shut us down, a riot would start, and they must come to pick up the pieces. They sent a letter to our chairman of our, of our crusade meeting saying that this would be the final service of our meeting, that the Hindus were taking over the next night. I did not know this. I'm glad I did not. I got up and I preached. The first night I preached the gospel. I preached about Jesus Christ. The only way, the only truth, and the only life. I talked about Jesus Christ, the world's only Savior. That was the first night. The second night, I chose my text, the text of St. Paul, where he preached at the Acropolis, there in Athens. And he talked about the unknown God. He talked about the unknown God, and he said that they were superstitious. He had found a altar to the unknown God, and he preached unto them Jesus. Well, I was possibly a little stronger than Paul. I borrowed some words from David, King David. And I said, I came to your city last night, and I noticed your idols and your images. I saw your temples. I saw your gods and your goddesses, and your idols and your images. And ladies and gentlemen, I've come to preach that there's only one way, and that way is the Lord Jesus Christ. I've come to talk about the living God. I said, I told the experience I had had among the headhunters, where I was preaching to the headhunters in the Philippine Islands in 1966 on Easter Sunday afternoon, standing in front of an idol. And I told the headhunters, this God has eyes, but he cannot see. He has ears, but he cannot hear. He has a mouth that has never spoken. He has hands that have never helped anybody. He has feet that are stationary. But I've come to preach about the living God who made the heavens and the earth. I've come to preach about the living God who has made all things. The ground you stand on and sit on belongs to my God. The sun that shines up in heaven belongs to my God. The river that flows by your banks belongs to my God. I said the air you breathe belongs to my God. And I told about this wonderful God who loved the world so much that he sent his son, his only son, and he came to seek and to save the lost. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our enemies. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. I said that this wonderful, wonderful Son of God came. He came. He was God in the flesh. He was God the Son who humbled himself and came down and wrapped himself in human flesh. So that he could suffer and bleed and die. I said his enemies rose up against him. And they nailed him to a cross. And they put him in a tomb. But he was such a, a, a warrior. He was so powerful. That early in the morning of the third day. He arose from the dead. And he is alive forevermore. And I shared this testimony. To the Hindus. That night in 1984. What I had shared with the Filipinos. With the headhunters in northern Luzon. In Tabuk. Way up there in Bontoc. And then, ladies and gentlemen, when I was finished preaching, I declared that Jesus Christ is the only Savior of the world and the only way to heaven. And at that moment, I heard voices against me. They put loudspeakers up against me. And they were condemning our meeting and saying that a riot would start. I did not know that. It was in their language. But at that very moment, I was making the altar call. And the Spirit of God swept the place. And about, oh, I would say almost a thousand people rushed forward to receive Christ. They came forward. These Hindus, Brahmins came forward. Also Muslims. And at that very moment as I was preaching, as I was making the altar call, and these 
1,000 people were rushing forward to receive Christ. 50 fanatics with stones and sticks were on their way. They were entering the park to break up the meeting to cause a riot. And then I prayed for the sick and a little boy, seven years of age, who was born lame, was instantly healed through a mass prayer. And he came to the platform, his mother and father brought him. And uh, he began to jump and shout and they were telling what happened. At the very moment these fanatics, these Hindu fanatics entered the grounds, this little boy and his parents were testifying. And people were standing to their feet, praising the Lord, glorifying God. And as these 50 fanatics came onto the grounds, they said, is this really true? Is that really so or so? The father of that little boy was a very famous, very, very well-known, very rich uh, businessman who was involved in politics. And he also was a Brahmin Hindu. And when these 50 fanatics saw what had happened, they dropped their stones and their sticks. And they pulled down their, their loudspeakers against me. Because God had performed the miracle among their own community, one of their own people. Come on, clap your hands and give God the praise. That was my introduction to Amdaba the next night. The crowd grew to 10,000. And then those who wanted to kill me brought me tea to drink and, and brought to me and wanted to kiss my feet. Of course, I did not allow them to kiss my feet. And I was smart. I didn't drink the tea just in case. <laughs> the next night we had 20,000, then 30,000, and then 40,000. These were Brahmin Hindus. We were in the heart of the Brahmin area. Every night, our loudspeakers reached 150,000 people. 16 loudspeakers reaching out at the final service with 40,000. Then I had to go to Pakistan and the people who were with me continued and they drew a crowd of 50,000 in northern India. Ladies and gentlemen, God is real. Jesus Christ is alive. If you believe that, shout hallelujah. hallelujah. I'm going to ask you to stand your feet, please. I wish to read. It's such a joy for us to be here with you. Thank you, sir. It's such a joy for us to be here with you. Thank you. And I thank God for the privilege of sharing the gospel. Just a few months ago, a young man by the name of John Ostomus, a Canadian Indian, 21 years of age, He'd been insane for seven years, since he was 14 years of age, incarcerated 12 times in a mental hospital in those seven years, demon-possessed. Every 60 seconds, a voice would speak to him, would say to him, kill yourself. I am Lucifer, I am your God, kill yourself, come to me. For seven years he was tormented with these horrible voice that constantly, day and night, every 60 seconds, 24 hours a day, spoke to him. He would go out in the middle of the night screaming obscenities and wanted to burn down houses, wanted to kill his neighbors, and wanted to kill himself. When he was seven years old, he began to smoke marijuana and sniff glue and sniff gasoline. And the devil got a hold of him when he was 14 years of age. He was an alcoholic and a drug addict. And the devil came to him and the voices started. The devil said, if you eat any solid food, you'll die. For seven years he had never touched solid food. In our crusade last September in northern Canada, on a cold, wet night in a big tent, the Spirit of God came upon him. He fell under the power of God. He was instantly healed. And it's normal today. Oh, let's praise the Lord. I wish to read as we stand, remain standing, from the, the epistle of St. Paul to the Romans. 
I wish to read from chapter 16 and verse number 20, reading as follows in Jesus' name. And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Everyone say, and the God of peace, and the and God the God of peace, peace shall bruise Satan. Satan. Shall bruise, shall bruise Satan, Satan under your feet. Under your feet. Shortly. Shortly. Shall we bow please for prayer? Almighty eternal God, I pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that you will bless yes. every man and woman and child gathered here today. The first assembly of God church in Honolulu. We pray, God, that you'll bless Pastor Cole and his family and all those who work with him. Yes. We pray for Honolulu. We pray for Hawaii. Yes. We pray, oh God, that you will bless yes. this state and this city and this nation. Yes. We pray for a mighty revival. Yes. It will sweep across America. Yes. We pray for this in the name of the Lord Jesus. We bind every unclean spirit that they can learn about these premises. Yes. In the name of the Lord Jesus, we pray now that you will fill this place with your power yes. Yes. and your strength. Yes. That you will save and heal and deliver. Yes. For Christ's sake and for God's glory with much thanksgiving. In Jesus' name. And everyone with you shout again. Amen. Amen. Well, oh, that's wonderful. Shout hallelujah. Hallelujah. And you may be seated, please. For the next 30 minutes or so, I wish to share a message entitled, The God of Peace is a Man of War. Everyone say, The God of Peace, God of peace. is a Man of War. The Man of War. If you don't believe that, let me share it. Let me read it to you from the Bible. The book of Exodus, chapter 15, and verse number 3. The Bible tells us exactly what I have just said. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Now there are several seeming paradoxes in the scriptures. And I'm going to share some of those paradoxes or seeming paradoxes. And show you how that a God of peace could be a man of war. Now we know that Jesus is our peace. We know that He's purchased our peace through the blood of the cross. We know when you come to Christ, you receive peace. Jesus said, My peace I give unto you. My peace I leave with you. Not as the world giveth give unto you. Let not your heart be troubled. Neither be afraid. He said, I give you my peace. So we know that our God is a God of peace. And we'll say, Our God is a God of peace. Our God is a God of peace. You know, it's one of His seven. Uh, redemptive names is Jehovah Shalom. Jehovah Shalom, the Lord our peace. So He is our peace. But the Bible tells us He also bruises. He also is a man of war. And the God of peace shall bruise Satan. He bruises Satan. And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. Now, St. Paul was writing to a church that was embattled, a church that was persecuted, a church that was impoverished, a church that had very little of this world's goods, a church that was under attack. And the victory had not come to them fully yet. He said, the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. Satan was still overpowering the church. He was still destroying. He was still defeating. He was still harming the church. But St. Paul is saying very soon now, Satan will be bruised under your feet. Amen. The God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. And in the meantime, he said, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. You know, it's wonderful to know that even though we have a God of victory and a God of power, and even though all of us go through times of testing and trial, and sometimes it seems as though we don't have the victory like we should have it. But it's at times like that when sickness comes, disease comes, trouble comes, that the grace of God fills our hearts. Amen. The grace of God is sufficient. And the grace of God is there to look after us. I'm glad for the grace of God. It was a church that needed the grace of God. The grace of God that would keep them through the trials, and through the temptations, through the times of persecution and poverty. The grace of God was there. 
Possibly you're going through a hard time. Well, the grace of God is with you. Amen. The grace of God will help you. The grace of God will cover you, will overwhelm you, lift you up. But the God of peace is also a man of war and bruises the enemy. Some will say he bruises the enemy. He bruises the enemy. So the Bible says, the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. Let's turn, shall we, to the book of Genesis. Genesis, the first book of the Bible, and it's chapter 3 and verse number 15. And the Bible says, God spoke. Let's go to verse 14. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field. Upon my belly shalt thou go, and thus shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head. Everyone shout these words, It shall bruise thy head. The seed of the woman. The seed of the woman is the Messiah. And here in the garden of Eden, after Satan had tempted our first parents, and after Eve had fallen, she had been deceived that Adam, and rather Adam, had fallen. He went in with, with his eyes open. Our first parents sinned. And the Bible tells us that God came down into the garden. And he came down to me for Adam and Eve. And he said, Adam, where art thou? And Adam said, we're hiding. God asked him why he was hiding. He said, we're naked. How did you know that you're naked? We're afraid. Why are you afraid? Have you eaten of the fruit that I forbade you to eat of? And he blamed his wife. He said, the woman that you gave me, it's not my fault. It's my wife's fault. It really, it's your fault. You gave me the woman. <laughs> the woman that you gave me, she's the one who gave me the fruit. God turned to the woman and said, what is this thou hast done? She made more sense. She said, the serpent tricked me. The devil lied to me. It's the devil who is to blame. And God turned to the devil within the serpent and said, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between thy seed and her seed, and the seed of the woman. Now here's the first mention of the Messiah, the first mention of the Savior. I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed, the devil's people, and the seed of the woman, the Messiah. And the Messiah, the seed of the woman, shall bruise thy head. Jesus Christ hung upon Calvary's cross, John 19 and 30, and he cried, it is finished. When he cried those words, it is finished, he was speaking in the Greek language, and he shouted the word, tetelestai, tetelestai, from the Greek verb teleo, and that Greek, that Greek verb teleo has three essential meanings. Number one, it means to finish something, to complete something, and to bring something to an end. And he had finished his work, he had done his job. He had brought to an end Satan's domination over the human race. He had finished his work and he had defeated the devil. The second meaning of that verb, tell you, it is fulfilled. He had fulfilled every scripture in the Old Testament concerning the Messiah. Every scripture, 332 scriptures in the Old Testament, 61 major prophecies, he fulfilled them all. And the third meaning of that verb, tell you, it is paid. He had paid for our sins. He was wounded for our transgressions. Yeah. He was bruised for our enemies. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. Amen. He had paid for our sins. I owed it, I could not pay. He paid it, he did not owe. When Jesus died on Calvary's cross for me. Oh, he hung between heaven and earth. And when he cried, it is finished. When he cried to tell us die, he was saying, I have finished my work. The blood is flowing. The fountain is open. And now the devil no longer has power over the children of men. If you believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ, he said, I have fulfilled every scripture concerning the Messiah. And I have paid the debt. I have paid for your sins. I have paid for your sicknesses. I have paid the supreme penalty. Ladies and gentlemen, the Bible tells us that Jesus Christ was bruised so that he could bruise the head of the devil. Amen. Amen. I want you to turn very quickly, will you please, to the book of Isaiah the prophet. It is such a powerful scripture, the one that I just quoted. Isaiah 53, let me read it. 
again. Let me give you just a bit more. Let's go back to verse number three. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he bore our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities and chastised for our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. Verse 6. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid upon him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed but he was afflicted. Verse 7. Yet he opened out his mouth. He is brought as a lamb for the slaughter. As a sheep before his shearers is done. So open it not his mouth. Let's look at verse number 10. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. Jesus Christ was bruised by God the Father so that he could crush the serpent's head. But before the serpent's head could be crushed, Jesus Christ had to be crushed. The Norwegian Bible says, it doesn't use the word bruise, it uses the word crush. It uses the word to crush. Jesus Christ was bruised, he was crushed. So that he could bruise the serpent's head and destroy the devil's power. I want you to see Jesus Christ hanging upon Calvary's cross, dying between two thieves. I want you to see him being bruised, being crushed. The weight of our sin crushed him. The weight of our sickness crushed him. And he cried out to tell us now that it's finished. Why did he have to die? Why did he have to be bruised and crushed? So that through his death he could destroy the devil. And the Bible says in the book of Hebrews chapter 2, if you'll turn very quickly, Hebrews chapter 2, you'll find how he crushed Satan. Hebrews, the second chapter, in verse number 14, for as much as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death, and we'll say death, yeah. he might destroy, say destroy, destroy. destroy. him that had the power of death, even the devil, say the devil, devil. and deliver, say deliver. Deliver. deliver, deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Jesus Christ took upon himself human flesh so that he could suffer and bleed and die, so that through his death he could destroy. Say destroy. Destroy. See, our God. Our God. He's a God of peace. He's a God of peace. But he is also a man of war. He's also a man of war. The God of peace crushes. He crushes. He bruises Satan. And the Bible tells us that Jesus Christ died on a countless cross. And when he died on that cross, Satan was bruised and crushed. That through his death, he might destroy the devil who has the power over death and deliver us. Everyone shout these words, Christ's victory. Christ's victory. Satan's defeat. Satan's defeat. And our liberty. And our liberty. Say it again, Christ's victory. Christ's victory. Satan's defeat. Satan's defeat. And our liberty. And our liberty. Well, clap your hands and come on. Can you shout hallelujah? Hallelujah. Oh, shout hallelujah. Hallelujah. The second seeming paradox we find in John's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 29. And John the Baptist points to the Lord Jesus and says, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. And we'll say, Behold the Lamb of God. Behold the Lamb of God. Which taketh away the sins of the world. Which taketh away the sins of the world. And then I want you to turn to Revelation chapter 5. And I wish to read from verse number 1. And I saw in the right hand of him 
the side of the throne, a book written within on the back side, seal with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and the loose seals thereof. And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither look thereon. And I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book, and the loose, the seven seals thereof. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne, and of the four beasts, in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb. It was shout the word, stood a lamb. Stood a lamb. I beheld and lo in the midst of the throne, and the four beasts in the midst of the elders to the Lamb, as it had been slain, and seven horns, and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth in all the earth. And he came and took the book of the right hand, him that sat upon the throne. When he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors or incense, which are the prayers of saints. The son of whose song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain, and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood. Saved by thy blood. That every kindred and tongue and people and nation has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. And I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, and the beasts of the elders, and the number of them was ten thousand times ten thousand, and thousands of thousands. Say with a loud voice, everyone say it after me. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. That was slain. To receive power. To receive power. And riches. Riches. And wisdom. And wisdom. And strength. And strength. And honor. And honor. And glory. And glory. And blessing. And blessing. Every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth, and such as in the sea, and all that are in them heard us saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power given him the sin upon the throne, and of the Lamb forever and ever, and the four beasts of said Amen. Man, and the four and twenty elders fell down and worship him that liveth forever and ever. Another seeming paradox the lamb is a lion, and the lion is a lamb. How beautiful! How beautiful! How beautiful! And they said to me, and one of the elders said unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah. Say the lion of the tribe of Judah. The lion of the tribe of Judah. Hath prevailed. Hath prevailed. Oh, how beautiful. And the lion of the tribe of Judah hath prevailed to open the book of the loose the seals threw off the seven seals. And I beheld him lower in the midst of the throne, the four beasts. <coughs> and in the midst of the elders of the lamb, as had been slain. I want you to come with me, please, to Revelation 19. Another portion of scripture that is so dear to my heart. I saw heaven open, verse 11. I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. He that sat upon it was called Faithful and True. And we'll say Faithful and True. Faithful and capital F, capital T. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes are the flame of fire. On his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen and white clean. And out of his mouth go with a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron. And tread up the wine, the of the fierceness, and the wrath of Almighty God. He had on a vesture, his thigh, and name written. King of kings and Lord of lords. Can you say it with me? King of kings, king of kings. and Lord of lords. Lord of lords. Say it, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. He is King of kings. King of kings. He is King of kings. King of kings. He is Lord of lords. Lord of lords. Say, our God. Our God. He's a man of war. A man of war. Oh, lift up your hands and shout hallelujah. 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 Can you shout hallelujah? Hallelujah. I'm going to close in a few moments. Another seeming paradox. John 3.16 For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For 
God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. A God of love is a God of judgment. Can you believe this God of love would be a God of judgment? Turn quickly to Revelation chapter 20. Let me share with you. I weep sometimes when I read this. I tremble sometimes as I read this. The 20th chapter of the book of the Apocalypse. The last book in the Bible, the Revelation. Verse number 1, and I saw an angel come down from heaven having the key of the bottomless pit. And the great chain in his hand, he laid hold of the dragon, the old serpent, which is the devil, and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him. And then verse number 10, and the devil that received them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night. Forever and ever, and we'll see forever and ever. Forever and ever. I didn't hear you. Forever and ever. It's a long time, it's a world without end. Brothers and sisters, forever. Say forever and ever. Forever and ever. And I saw a great white throne, and in the saddle from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged for those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Oh, that is so serious, isn't it? Let me read from Daniel as I close in a few moments. Sinner, black slide, I get ready. I'm going to ask you to come to Christ tonight. Sinner, this morning rather, sinner, backslider, lukewarm Christian. I want you to prepare your heart to make things right between you and God. Daniel 7, verse number 9. Tremble as I read it. I beheld the thrones were cast down, and the ancient of days did sit, was garbed by the snow, and the hair of his head was like the pure wool, his throne was like the fiery flame, his wheels as burning fire, and a fiery stream issued came forth before him, thousand thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him, and the judgment was sent, and the books were opened. I beheld all the thrones were cast down, and the ancients, ancient of days, almighty God, did sit. His garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like the pure wool. The God of love is now a God of judgment. His throne was like a fire flame. His wheels as burning fire. The fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand, thousands ministered to him. Thousand, ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. And the judge was sent and the books were opened. And Revelation chapter 1. It is verse number 10, and I was in the spirit of the Lord's day. I heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet saying, I am El Final Omega, the first of the last. And what thou seest, write in the book, and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia. Verse 12. I turned to see the voice speak with me, being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. In the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down the foot, and girt about the paps, the golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow. His eyes were as a flame of fire. His feet like on fine grass, as if they burned in a furnace. His voice as the sound of many waters. 
In his right hand, seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp to its sword. And his countenance was as the sun shineth in strength. And I saw my fellow asleep as dead. He laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am either liveth or was dead. Behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And the keys of hell. God of peace is a man of war. A lion, a cable lamb, then a lion again. And the God of love is a God of judgment. When I first began in the ministry, I was a businessman. Traveling businessman. I would preach every opportunity that I had. I was a Lutheran, a deacon in the Lutheran church. God filled me with the Holy Spirit and I began to preach. And great miracles began to happen. Prince Rupert, British Columbia. Many years ago, I had never heard the voice of God like this before. But all of a sudden, in the Pentecostal Assembly of God Church, on a Sunday morning, I had made the altar call. I was closing the service. The pastor was pronouncing the benediction. When all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit said to me, there are two young ladies in the service this morning. If they don't come this morning, they'll never come. You must make another altar call. I said, God, is this really you? Is it possible? God said, son, stand up and say it. I said, pastor, let me say something else. I said, there are two young ladies who are receiving your final call. If you don't come this morning, you'll never come. You'll die in your sins. Two young ladies, 18 and 20 years of age, ran forward and fell at the altar. They came back that night. I left. Seven days later, we heard the news. A fire had swept across Prince Rupert. British Columbia. An apartment block was ravished and burned down, was razed, destroyed. One of those young girls that made her commitment had died in the fire. Seven people had died in the fire. Grown men stood there and cursed and wept. Women sobbed and a fireman he kicked a lump of dirt and cursed and that clump of clay jumped in the air and opened up and out fell a little white Bible. And they looked at it, there was no scorch. It was like new. And right on the front, Yvonne Morvan was imprinted in gold. Yvonne had gone out on the Monday and bought herself a brand new Bible. Amen. She was gone six days later in the gospel. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads. With every head bowed and eye closed. How many will say, Pastor Max, God's servant, man of God, this morning I want to make my peace with God. This morning I want to change my way. This morning I am prepared to repent and give my heart to Christ. I'm a sinner, I'm a backslider, I'm a lukewarm Christian, but this morning I will say yes to God. Would you raise your hand? All over the audience, lift your hand. Sinners and backsliders, quickly, lift it high as I can see it. I'm closing two minutes. How many more will raise your hand and say yes? Congregation, stand your feet, please. For 50 years, Pastor Max Solbrecken has awakened the conscience of his audiences through the anointed proclamation of the claims of Christ who said, No man can serve two masters. You cannot serve God and mammon. The truth is, you are either for him or against him. You cannot remain neutral. Great costs are involved in spreading of Christ's gospel. Please consider investing in this ministry. Contact Max Solbrecken at MSWM, Box 44220, RPO, Garside, Edmonton, Alberta. T5V1N6 Canada.
You have been watching the Come Home to Jesus television ministry with Canada's preacher man, Dr. Max Solbrecken, who has proclaimed the Word of God across the world for 50 years without fear or favor of man or devil. Ask for Canada's revival magazine, The Cry of His Coming, when you write. Invest in souls by supporting this end-time ministry. Please contact Max Solbrecken at MSWM, Box 44220, RPO Garside, Edmonton, Alberta, T5V1N6, Canada. Oh, die again and cry.